Hello, and good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, so my name is Damon Reeves. I am the Associate Curator of Community Engagement and Access here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and also as part of the artistic team for Philadelphia Assembled. So I just want to say a quick welcome, and thank you for joining us for this, this lovely program. I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, just first and foremost, a little bit about Philadelphia Symbol. If you're not familiar, it's a large-scale community-based project initiated by artist Jana von Hesvag um, and a team of collaborators that has grown to be about 167 people across the city, all representing their concerns, their agencies um, in, into this exhibit that first started with a public phase out in the city and then moved into its current inter iteration, this museum phase, which goes through to uh, December 10th. So please check the website. There's tons of programs like this one happening all the time and would love to see you come back and engage more with the exhibition. Um, if you're coming to visit, there's always people with host buttons that are in the space. They're collaborators that worked on the project that are here to talk more about what they do and, and what their contribution was to this piece. So we're really excited to have this panel or this, uh, this conversation happening today. Um, and I want to introduce, starting first and foremost, introduce Betty Leecraft. So Betty Leecraft is a shapeshifter of textiles and mixed media fiber and teaching artist and lecturer residing in Philadelphia. She blends multiple techniques and processes, uh, creating works blurring lines between art, qu art quotes, wearable art, sculpture, and installation. Her work is informed by artistic and cultural traditions of Africa and the African diaspora, addressing themes of identity, heritage, symbolism, nature, ritual, and the unseen. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Betty Leecraft. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. And I'd like to thank all of you for your presence today. Uh, it's pretty gratifying. I'm so glad that the rain didn't extend into today. And um, the first thing I'd like to do is give a large amount of thanks to the Philadelphia Assembled Administrative Crew, because there are many names so I'll say the entire Philadelphia Assembled administrative team and support crew uh, for all that they have done, and especially to Damon Reeves and Phoebe Bachman for helping to set up the display that you see, and for Margaret Huang, who uh, was the tech person that put together the PowerPoint, because I am in a catch-up mode technology-wise, as are most people in my generation. So um, without further ado, I would like to, first of all, ask the audience, how many of you here do anything that could uh, be considered art with fabric or sewing or knitting or crocheting or dyeing or any of those other things? And for those who do, and this is something I like, lighting and all those other kinds of things, you know, it's all part of a creative process. And the reason this is called textiles is social commentary. Some of that is pretty evident with what you see that is on display. And I felt it was important to have people look at textiles other than just something to wear and look beautiful in but also textiles that have particular significance for an occasion or for even mourning, something like that. So what I would like to do first, before I introduce all of our artists, and I'm purposely calling this a conversation because I don't want the formality that the word panel seems to invoke. You know, this is, I want this to be a friendlier space than that. So um, the fabrics that you see up, and we'll start on this side. I actually bought those three back from Ghana, West Africa, when I went there with my deceased uh, stepbrother who's installed as a chief during the 50th anniversary celebration of independence. And for those who don't know, the the gentleman in the very first panel is Kwame Nkrumah, the very first president after independence was gained, and he actually got a portion of his education at Lincoln University. So he went to um, 
higher education in the United States. And then look what happened. He became their first president. So those three clause are a small example of over 12 different ones that I counted that I saw that people had made up into garments. There were flags as big as the Lowe's building of the Ghanaian flag hanging from top to bottom. And I had never seen that kind of celebratory thing happening with fabric. And on this side, um, shortly after Nelson Mandela passed, I wrote to a friend and asked her if I sent her the money, would she pick up whatever she could so that I could have a memento? So what you're looking at from uh, closest to the monitor, that was actually given to me by a Zulu friend here who's a member of the Old Guard ANC. So that was a, a fabric to celebrate the 75th year of the existence of that organization. In the middle, which I really am feeling so proud to have is a cloth that was printed when Nelson Mandela was campaigning. So to have that is, is, I would say that's one of the most precious things I have. And then uh, the other part that came, and this was yardage, this red and white one, is called shui shui cloth. And that's a whole other explanation I can get into after this is all over. But the cloths that I have here that have his image, including the one in the front, which people wore during his mourning period, you can almost see his process of um, maturing, I'll say. So each one has a different aspect of him uh, as a man. And as I said, the one in the middle was what most people draped around their shoulders when they went to his memorial. So I feel very fortunate to have all of these pieces, including the two on either side of Nelson Mandela that celebrated the first African descended president of the United States. And both of these claws were printed in Tanzania. And I bought them online because I was scouring, trying to find a commemorative claw to celebrate uh, for Barack Obama's election. So all of these could really be called commemorative claws, but if a head of state visits an African country, more than likely there will be a cloth that is printed that has their likeness. And it becomes not only a memento, but a record and a documentation of that person's visit uh, to that country. So for that reason, I wanted to have something that pointed up textiles as social commentary. And I'm not saying you can't wear these. Later on, I'll show you how to wrap one of these. This is called a kanga cloth. And they're usually worn <coughs> two together, something around your shoulders or wrapping around the top of your body and also for the bottom from the waist down. Now, I would like to go on with introducing our wonderful artists. And these artists were chosen because they have some special connection to textiles, fiber, or some other element of that discipline. Uh, first, and I will be introducing in alphabetical order, Lisa Ajay, who comes to us from Ghana, West Africa. This is Lisa, and I'm going to read a little about her. An avid artist since a toddler, Lisa has been using visual arts as her outlet and expressing her experience of being embedded in an interracial and intercultural family of Ghanaian and Italian heritage. Lisa. And um, what you see in back is the drawing that is in the exhibition that Lisa um, has. And I found out later that she knew how to do batik work. And I'm saying to myself, well, why am I not seeing that? You know, so automatically that's where I'm gonna go. And that was one of the reasons she is on the panel because she comes from a cultural tradition 
where fabric and textiles plays a great part of the everyday uh, part of life. Um, the next panelist is Mayada Alhamsi, who is not with us as yet, but we're going to also read about her. And Mayada comes to us from Iran, and I didn't have a photo of her, so I wanted to use what was my favorite of her two paintings that are inside, and uh, on the right-hand side, it speaks of Baghdad. And uh, the other picture that you see is the inside of the geodesic dome in its original size, because what you see inside is a miniaturization of what had happened. And um, since she is not here, I'll just speak to her culture a little later. But what I would like to read you about her is about her paintings, which are on display at the Philadelphia Folklore Project out in West Philadelphia off of 50th and Baltimore. Beautiful paintings, you don't want to miss it. Uh, she says, my paintings represent my two homes, my old home, Baghdad, which you see on the right, and my new one, Philadelphia, which you'll see when you go inside. Between the two, there was a long journey of fear, hopelessness, aimlessness, and emptiness, a journey of lost wishes, seeking peace, and a refuge with the hope of good living. The next artist is Linda Grace. And uh, Linda and I have known each other for a little while. And what I didn't realize when I first saw her vessels was the meaning behind them. And we'll get into that because um, I don't want to give it all away right now. Uh, Linda Grace uses the delicate art of needlecraft to address injustice and our intricate interconnection to it. Her most current work, Aspirations of the Lost, the Longing, and the Ignored, is a series of over 60 crocheted vessels honoring the victims of government-sanctioned injustice, their dreams, and intentions. Linda Grace. Our next artist is Charlene Griffith with all the kind of jewelry I like. And she's going to be in trouble if she ever lets a piece go, not being on her body. Um, Charlin has a suspicion that art making is a necessity to get two decades an educator and 10 as an interdisciplinary artist. She makes a statement about gentrification and invisibility with the piece, nah, we made this place. Mused with community, the textile visually challenges the concept of placemaking. And um, there is Charlin and her textile. And that is actually the entryway to the film room, which is next to the guard station down the hallway. The next artist is Shari Hirsch. And I had met Sherry at various points throughout this project because she is what is known as a corridor manager. So it is her job, which I am not jealous of, to go between these different groups, working groups, and keep a check on what's going on. And I think that's a very special talent because I'm sure I would have lost my mind. <laughs> Shari Hirsch is a community artist and organizer. As senior project manager and founder of Restored Spaces at Mural Arts Philadelphia, Hirsch researches and develops innovative projects in the public sphere. In partnership with artists, activists, youth, and communities, Hirsch facilitates a collaborative model of practice that emphasizes art and creativity as essential vehicles for catalyzing dialogue, building relationships, and making decisions collectively. Shari Hirsch. And 
Our last artist I had met as a result of seeing her work up in this project. And I was like, who is this? And how do I get in touch with her? Uh, Diana Laris Gocia. I'm really, um, what can I say? I guess I'm just so pleased that we have such a geographic spectrum of people with us. Diana was born in Argentina and learned to sew, knit, and crochet, taught by her mother, grandmother, and aunts. Diana's aunts spent time with her cutting and sewing dresses for her dolls, and she set a path for a very artistic, productive future. Once in the United States, she learned watching a TV program on quilting how to transform little pieces of cloth into intricate artwork, and it has given her a great deal of joy to develop the sewing skills into pieces of artwork. Diana. Now, one thing I need to let you know is uh, the only way I felt I could properly introduce the people other than the words on the page is that you saw their faces and something that they have, that they have done because I felt that that would um, help me in the job that I have here, which is not an enviable one either. But um, I would like to thank all of you right now, collectively, for being present and putting up with my many emails and um, just being the wonderful artist that you are. This conversation is going to revolve around particular questions and what's going to happen is um, I have a little tiny thing that I'd like to read. And this is going to be a question that anyone on the panel can answer or not answer. But uh, I'm asking, what is the significance of your particular Philadelphia Assembled exhibited work with regard to your working group? And what or who influenced you to start creating art. So that's something really everyone can answer, but if you choose not to, that's okay. So we'll start with Lisa. Um, I think for me, my biggest inspiration when it came to creativity and art was my grandmother. Um, I was sent back a lot as a youth uh, to just kind of absorb my heritage. And I just remember everything that was in the house and the smells and just her overall uh, candor was from the roots up. Everything was built on her own. She built her house. Well, you know, the, the men around built the house. But everything was made, you know, to order. Um, particularly for her, she was a, um, a, a headmaster at a school. So a lot of the dresses that you would see for the girls and the met the boys to wear were uniforms that she made. On top of that, she was a caterer. On top of that, my grandfather was the headmaster. So it was like one of those things where wherever I turned, my 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 own blood was making their own a success. And so growing up, it was just something that stayed with me. Um, my mom was a really huge, uh, you know, guiding light with that, where she felt like you know. There's no, no problem in America. You can't have issues in America. If you want to, you just create it. Create your solution, and that's it. There was always a, a resolve to her that I just felt that was, um, you know, just deeply embedded in my own, like, this fiber of my soul. Um, so that's basically, you know, how I was influenced growing up. And then also, it was just one of those things where she... she my grandma passed down this thing to my mother with clothing, to have clothing and have textiles and fabric meant that you were of a stature in the environment. That meant you had enough food to eat. That meant you had, you were of, of some sort of economic status. A lot of the kids who were wearing like kind of rags here and there, you could tell that they were coming from a family that might have been disjointed or, you know, didn't have enough, um, you know, support. And oftentimes that's how we even created our family was we 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 call them like wayward kids like kids who were just in America we call them adopted or you'd foster them but here it's more or there it was more of an idea of well you come in we'll take you in we'll provide you food shelter 
um, and then also spiritual uh, just growth. And that, to me, was something that I always used to influence my art, um, how I dress. Um, a lot of the clothing that you see today were, were made. They were made for me um, by either my aunt, so my grandmother, or my mother. So it was one of those things that just stayed uh, with me, and I'm you know, deeply, to this day, inspired by it. So my grandmother uh, taught me how to crochet and knit. Well, not just my grandmother, it was uh, my aunt and some of the women that lived in the block um, that I grew up on, the village, I'll call them the ladies in the village. And um, it's interesting, my grandmother um, was a member of something called the Mercy Douglas Blanket Club. Mercy Douglas was a hospital um, in West Philadelphia. And she and her friends would get together regularly um, as a knitting group, and they would make these um, afghans for the patients and for others. Um, and I look back at her work um, today, and, and it, she influenced me in such a way, not only in terms of the craft, but also just in a sense of what those afghans symbolized, security, warmth, sanctuary, um, and it was a community of people that worked together to create these um, magnificent pieces. She influenced me um, as a young child, and it remains with me today. So the work that I create is really based in community, it's really based in a sense of sanctuary, it's in, based in a sense of, of us you know, having, um, of, of people being of value and people having safety, having a secure, a secure place. Um, and, and, and so that is, that is what I do today. My, my uh, father and my mother were very much involved in community and um, my father was, um, I grew up in West Mount Airy and so my father was very instrumental in creating an amazing community in West Mount Airy and so, um, Again, my parents, my parents' influence um, um, have, has also um, manifested itself in, in my artwork. Um, so my, my particular piece, uh, as Betty uh, said, is called Nah, We Made This Place. And with that textile, Oh, um, with that textile, I think uh, I was really struck by the very bare bones of what a textile is, that it's interwoven, um, you know, strings. It's strings that are then, that are made, if we go backwards, from a particular kind of fiber, which may, in the case of using cotton, come from a plant. And so I'm really drawn to um, breaking down a thing to its most simple and and then going out to the macro of it which ended up being a textile that I could play with and construct into um, a thing and with regards to gentrification um, which I, that word is becoming so played out to me now because it's so much it's so full but the meaning of it now it's so easy to write it off for people on any part of the spectrum of that experience. Um, but I think that that's the very reason why a textile felt appropriate because it's there's layers, it's a woven piece with, with then having some image printed on it, a message uh, sort of asserted on it. Um, and I think that's the title, it goes back to why the title is um, so fantastic, Textiles as a Social Commentary, because what does it take for a piece of clothing? Like what kind of meaning do we have to apply to it? Um, and I think for me, my, my background with um, textiles is that I grew up, my mother is from Trinidad and Tobago, my father's from Guyana. I was raised wearing custom made clothing also. Um, and then being in this country, wanting nothing more than to be a black American because blackness was beautiful to me. It was different than the um, experience I was having as a Caribbean person. And so like, like wanting to come 
away from like wearing the traditional stuff that my parents wanted me in that again was like some indicator of of our family and like how we are and wanting like to explore and to explore more African textiles and explore like streetwear, which, you know, is is such an important commentary about what we do with the fabrics that we had a part in um, growing and cultivating for this country in terms of industry. So, you know, as you can hear, I'm just, I'm all over the place with it because I think there's there's so much meaning for me in doing the work. It's okay right now? Okay. Um, so, I think I want to start with the piece, but it, it was it is it um is there a slide of it? Okay. So I made two pillows that are in the reconstruction uh house. And um I think what was important to me about its relationship to as Betty described, I'm in the corridor, I'm a movement editor, I'm part of the artistic team. So most of that is about um, translating between and moving between the atmospheres, but those particular pieces are specifically about reconstruction because at a time when the editor of reconstruction could not really uh, tend for a lot of reasons, that's Denise, who I just saw a minute ago, um, I attended all the meetings and helped them develop their public phase. So I take visual notes. I'm really not a list person. I have trouble with words. Um, I always think, I love Charlin's uh, articulants. I always feel a little like bumbling with words. So when I take notes, I draw like pictures. So the pillow, the blue jean pillow with the circles is actually my drawn notes about the formation. There it is. That's the formation of the um, public phase. So um, that is directly about reconstruction, the self and the house in the middle. You can read it across the top, self to family, to community, to the wider environment. The, uh, um, so for me, I think about the textile in this as about uh, record and documentation. And um, for me, working in textiles is about feminism, and it's about rejecting or finding a better dialogue with my ancestors through textiles, not through painting. I'm trained as a painter. And having a dialogue with uh, the tradition of painting became untenable for me and had no relationship to community. So um, in addition, the repetition of stitching, I prefer hand stitching over machine stitching, is about healing. And um, AEA is a very particular and healing place to be. It's embodied knowledge. It starts with a check-in and always ends with an assessment. It's about moving from alienation to collectivity, about moving from self to relationship with others. So for me, in documenting what was going on through stitching was about taking the healing journey that is present every day with that group of people and, and connecting to it through documenting through stitching. So that's kind of like the complexity of it for me is all those things together. And I'm just struck by the grandparents in this conversation. My grandparents were all sewers. Uh, both uh, my grandmother and grandfather on my father's side, a seamstress and a tailor. And on my mother's side, so my father's a Hungarian Jew. He's the only person born in this country in his family. And my mother uh, Pennsylvania, was Pennsylvania Dutch. And so I grew up in the context, all my clothes were made by my grandmother. And... Um, just it was constant sewing. So I've sewn since I was really little. I still don't like the machine so much, but um, uh, I think that that value of making is just a, just a beautiful way to connect the past and the future and record the present. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I was, the, the reason of uh, making that, the quilt that is exhibited, I was invited by the president of an organization called Partners of the Americas uh, to do a quilt uh, to, to uh, collaborate with this African-American exhibit and to um, teach 
uh, some of the members might technique. Uh, Partners of the Americas was organized by the Kennedy family and uh, with the idea, as a result of the Alliance for Progress, with the idea of joining culturally and educationally countries in the United States with countries in Latin America. So in 1985, when I came for the second time to the United States, a few days after I arrived, a, a person called Eleanor Elkin invited me to go to Harrisburg and I joined the group. As a result, um, since Pennsylvania, the East of Pennsylvania has a, a connection or is a charter with the state of Bahia, Brazil, which was the first capital of a, of a Brazilian country, I traveled to Brazil several times and got involved in helping people with intellectual disabilities, training lifeguards and students in, in emergency services and, and so on. What I, I personally got out of those trips was um, in one of the visits there to an island, I saw a group of African Brazilian women at the beach. Uh, doing lace with a round pillow and doing lace. So I got very curious. I was told that there were French nuns that uh, taught the, the population and they have a significant industry of lace making. So that's my next step. I, I'm involved with the lace group and, and I'm perfecting that, that skill. But um, for, the, for the handwork, um, I got together with a group of, of the participants that were organizing this activity. And Eleanor, in conversation, said, well, what should I do about African culture, representing African culture? Uh, my background is uh, German, Latino. So uh, I had to really think of what would represent, uh, it would be significant for this activity. So Eleanor, who is now 100 years old, said, well, why don't you do the, the continent of Africa? <laughs> so I um, went to the Google, got the, the technique is to expand. I take a, a picture, take it to Kinkos and expand 400% or 600% and get the pattern to do whatever I'm doing. So then, so I had the idea, and then it came, uh, where do I get the cloth? And uh, I started asking, because I have all kinds of remnants of all the dresses that I have made, and uh, cloth that I was given, but none really significantly African. So a friend of mine came to the rescue. He's um, um, born and raised in the Netherlands, lived in Suriname, and married an African-American professor. So they um, kind of reluctantly <laughs> gave me the stash of African prints. Most of them uh, African motifs were printed in the Netherlands. And that's how I was able to get the countries, uh, you know, with, with different African cloths. And then came the animals. And um, so there was a picture like this, two by two, from the National Geographic of Elephants. Again, I took it to Kinko's expander. That's how the elephants came to be in the, in the picture. And then there was a cloth very significant because it really represented slavery, African people, but kind of in a very particular um, way of, of depicting. So I took a piece of that and put it in the middle. And a woman from Switzerland who was raised, who lived in Tanzania and in Africa, in different African countries, oh, that's, that's from Tanzania. <laughs> so she immediately identified the, the origin of that piece. So um, one night after I delivered the quilt, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I said, well, that quilt should be called Odunde. And then I said, well, what does the word mean? <laughs> I have no idea. So I went to the, I stood up, turned on the computer, looked for the word Adunde. And then I participated several times in those celebrations in Philadelphia. Um, so it, I realized that Odunde is a made up word. I thought it had some African origin, but no, it's a made up word. 
and it was created by Mrs. Fernandez, who had died two weeks prior to all this situation. She died on August 14th. So I said, well, that's, we are going to, this quilt is in honor to her and her, um, you know, her vision of the diaspora and how to, how to promote the African-American diversity. So that's my story. Thank you. Um, actually, the word Odunde refers to a New Year celebration. And when they go to the river, they are um, honoring a water deity called Oshun, which is uh, celebrated in the Ifa tradition in the Yoruba people of Nigeria. So Odunde um, is basically a New Year word, a word for New Year. But what I am most fascinated with, and I'm repeating some of what you all have already said, my grandmother on my mother's side put the first needle and thread in my hand and who hid scissors from me, I understand as a girl, that I would always find and start whacking on family photos. I'm not sure. I said, I was probably trying to tell you something then. And then uh, I was probably trying to tell you something then and uh, the occasion that I recall cutting the fringe off the whole side of a bedspread. <laughs> and the reason I remember it, I was about five. I'm sitting there with these white fringes all around me and my mother says, who did that? I don't know. So I'll just say um, I was reminded in the old head way that I had done something that was not acceptable. Um, my grandmother, who was from Vance County, North Carolina, was a professional dressmaker. And her sister was a quilter and a midwife. And I remember my mother telling me that it was her job at the quilting bee to separate the colors of fabric for the women. And she remembered my great aunt Laura saying, Send that red down the middle. I said, well, do you know what she meant? Was she talking about down the middle of the whole quilt, down part of a block? She said, I never really knew. And with me making the quilt that's in the show, I didn't realize maybe subconsciously that had manifested because red did get sent down the middle of that quilt on the front and the back. And um, having that kind of exposure to a generation before to gain whatever artistic skills in whatever form I think is very significant and I'm realizing all of us have some form of that in common. And a lot of my work I dedicate to ancestors because that was also the case on my father's side uh, where his mother who had 10 children quilted and did tatting, which is considered needle lace. And hearing my elder aunt saying that my grandmother did needle lace around their plain little undershirts to make them a little more special. So if you're in a farming environment, you were working all the time. So to have some little special something like that would make the girls feel um, a little more um, dainty or whatever. And that she also was, from what I understand, teaching those female children to quilt at the age 14. So all of those female relatives, and they never said it to me, but one did. And I said, well, what happened to it? It got used up. You got 10 children, stuff's going to get used up. And I'm just sorry nothing survived that my grandmother made for me to see except one linen pouch that my aunt had saved, that had pull and drawn work uh, in its construction, some tatting around the outside, and a little drawstring. So I do have that one thing. But ancestors are part of the reason why I feel I do create, because I guess I was the one that they saw that was going to keep it going and would take it further. And thankfully, uh, and thanks to them, I have been able to develop other aspects of that. 
And with that being said, um, I would like to ask Lisa, and I have visited Ghana, that's how I got those things. Um, I would like to ask you how or what kind of textiles uh, identify you with Ga culture, because I know your ethnic group is called Ga, and um, what particular textile or weaving or other techniques are associated with Ga people? I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the kente cloth. Uh, that's like prevalent within the Ashanti region, specific to the Akan um, tribe. And within Akan is the Ga tribe, which is where I'm from. So it's um, probably, you can equate it to being from maybe South Philadelphia and yeah, some family in West. Um, but what I love about it is it's used to celebrate. It's used to commemorate when someone's getting married, if there's some, a king being indoctrined into a new um, area, tribe, uh, being introduced you know, to land, or someone who's made high achievements. So you'll see even for Kwame Nkrumah, he you know, was the president, but more importantly, if you see a lot of his pictures, he has a nice kente cloth dra draped around his uh, torso. Um, typically, the men will wear it in a two-piece, in a one-piece style, kind of like a toga, um, a similar to, and females will wear it around their waist, or one covering their tor torso, and then if you're really getting like fancy into it, they will create a headdress, I call it, like it wrapped in very intricate styling. Um, there's women who just make that, and it's something that's um, very prestigious in my culture. Um, I remember specifically as a little girl, um, a petiquing process that's also kind of like a close second because of just the, um, just the, the layer of complexity. It just reminds me of life. I always kind of stacking on like knowledge or experience. So I just remember these huge, uh, they kind of look like vats, but they were made from earth, like clay vat. They kind of remind me of like the tops of volcanoes how they're like, there's like a, a depression, but inside is all this dye from tree bark and from plants. And I distinctively remember the men like toiling over it. My uncles, I have 10 aunts, one uncle, and then the men who surround him because, you know, they want to have that masculine kind of president presence. But um, I remember them like t just really like taking all day. If I woke up to them toiling around by mid afternoon, they were still doing it. And it was something that just seemed like it took a lot of pre uh, patience and um, dedication. Um, I was highly observant as a child. So a lot of, I think my visual memory comes from the creativity I witnessed around me. And um, the specific ones were the kente uh, because, because again, it, my family had a, a sense of prestige in our area, whether it was you know being educators or or a highly known seamstress, or even my grandma, she would take um, kente into what we would call the bush. Like if you're a bush baby, that means you've been, you're like in rural, 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 rural parts of Ghana where it's hard to, um, it's hard to uh, necessarily get information to. So um, cloth, kente especially, and batik fabrics uh, were ways of communicating messages to areas and places where people um, didn't necessarily get that uh, communication or news, if you will. So um, there's another part. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, the other part is, are you wearing goth fabric or accessories today? And if so, would you please say a little bit about it? And you might want to stand up. Yes. Wait a minute. Miss uh, Betty is always uh, remarking on my my threads, but so this is a piece my aunt has made, and as you can see, it's kind of hard to see. It has a lot of pins. I just have a lot of that.
has just joined us and if we could have um, her piece up I had spoken about your piece that was my favorite of the two paintings which is um, honoring Baghdad the thing that is special um, as I said that geodesic dome is very much bigger in its first iteration than it is now but the pillow and the carpet arrangements are basically Mayada's idea, and she and Linda worked together to do the upholstered benches that are in um, the dome, as you see it now, and there are even a few back over there by that wall. So Linda did the upholstering of those benches. But the thing that I felt Mayada brought to the whole project was the way in which textiles and carpets and pillows and things like that are used in her culture. And as soon as I saw that and they told me where she was from, I said, yeah, I, I see it and I get it. So uh, if you wouldn't mind saying something about the cultural significance of textiles in your culture and uh, how that came to influence what is going on in the interior of the dome. Thank you. Uh, actually, my culture is like full. Can't you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. No? <laughs> okay. Uh, close. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, the textile in my country, it was like, uh, we have patterns, if you know about the Islamic culture and the patterns in Islamic cultures. So it's, uh, it was reflected in my uh, uh, choice of the pillows and stuff to make the interior design of the dome. And the colors that I've chosen, it was, I wanted to make it like colorful, that one uh, who enters in the dome uh, has the feeling of welcoming space and feel the warmth of the space. So like this stuff, I wanted to incorporate this stuff together. 
And with the help with, with Linda, we were talking and discussing how to arrange these uh, collections. And uh, do you want me to talk about the painting? Okay. Yeah, I have also participated with my paintings. I have two paintings. This is uh, Baghdad. I imagined Baghdad like uh, the city of uh, 1019, Arabian Nights, like with the domes uh, and the city, the old city over the Tigris River. It's in Baghdad. So it's like this my imagination with this stuff. Yeah. Now, not being able to stand the needles for tattoo, the one thing that does work for me is henna. And as you can see, that uh, she's got a lovely design on her hand. I don't know if that was planned, but thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we had a group, women group, refugee women. So on Friday, we have like this gathering, and they went henna for us. <laughs> it's beautiful. Now, um, piggybacking on what Mayada has had to say, I'm going to hand the mic to Linda Grace uh, after I finish this. I forget. We only, I forget I only have two. Um, Linda, you upholstered the benches inside the dome. I'd like to know, and I'm sure the audience would like to know, what materials were used, and um, how did you and Mayada make creative decisions regarding fabric selection, and were there challenges for installation? So um, the bench, by the way, was made, the benches were made by Traction Company. When they showed us the benches, they uh, were just wooden and med, wooden, I'm sorry, wood and metal. And Mayada immediately looked at that and said, this is not gonna work. <laughs> she wanted to have something that was gonna be more comfortable, something that had textile on it, something uh, that was softer. And so I looked at it and um, I said, Mayada, I'll upholster them. I will upholster them. Now, I never upholstered before. So, <laughs> but I was just trying to solve a problem. Mayada was very passionate. Yes, Mayada? Very passionate about what she wanted. And I wanted to make sure that um, we had something that was not only pleasing to Mayana, but it was pleasing to, to the eye for everybody. Um, and so I took on the task. And then when I got the, wooden, the wood home, uh, because we were able to separate the wood from the metal, um, I got the wood home and I said, oh my God, what am I doing? Uh, <laughs> we went shopping. Uh, and may I chime in here too, we went shopping. Um, I do not like shopping. So in terms of challenges, that was one of the challenges. We spent a lot of time shopping, looking for fabric. Huh? I was fasting, you remember? <laughs> yes, you were. Ramadan, Mayada, yeah. Mayada was fasting. And uh, it was Ramadan. Yeah. And we um, were, were shopping. We had a lot to do and a little bit of time, right? Yeah. So we went to quite a number of stores looking for pillows and what else? The budget also. It was another challenge. Yes. The budget was very limited. We need to find some materials that can fit our budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, we were able to find some really beautiful things. Yeah. Mayada has a phenomenal eye. Uh, <laughs> we were able to find some good things. I just kind of tucked away my lack of interest in shopping. I just said, we have to do it. We have to do it. Let's just get it done. Um, and um, we found these beautiful vinyl fabrics yeah. um, that... Uh, we were able to find the colors that complemented the colors in the dome. The dome that was at 10th and Jefferson, the dome, there was a large dome. I forgot um, how large it was. There was a very large dome at 10th and, De and Jefferson. It started there. What you see here in this room here is certainly not the same dome. It was much, much smaller. But we were able to find fabrics that complemented um, the, the colors uh, of, um, uh, of the doors for the dome and um and with that um we went to i went to work putting put making sure that the the uh, benches were upholstered 
uh, properly. It was, it was, I enjoyed upholstering. I really did. Maybe I'll take that up too. Um, but long story short, um, Mayada's eye and, uh, her selection of fabrics, um, we were able to get to get, you know, what we, what I think are some pretty attractive, um, benches. <laughs> well, I would just like to say that, um, when I first went in the dome, on Jefferson Hospital Courtyard. I went with her because yeah. she was going to hang some things inside. You loved it. And as soon as I got in there, I was like, well, can I spend the night here? <laughs> you know, true. there was a hammock. And I'm looking at all these wonderful things on the floor, and it's reminded me of my first apartment because we didn't have money for furniture, so we had all kind of pillows and things on the floor. And it took my mind back to an earlier time, and it was a, a feeling of great comfort entering that space and since it's called sanctuary that is exactly yeah. what it felt like sanctuary and um since you still have the mic the next set of questions is actually for you okay. because what i'm doing audience is trying to make sure that when you go away you may not remember everything about each person but you may at least remember one thing about one of these artists and I feel that, that that's the big thing, is to go away knowing at least one thing about someone whose work you may never have seen before. Now, with Linda, I wanted to know something about the theme of your work and why you chose it. And it's kind of a multi-layer question. How are the themes relevant to um, the present day and the past? And your preference for materials? So I'll start with the preference of materials. Um, fiber for me is a metaphor for community. I'm not sure if I said that before, but it is a metaphor <clears throat> of community. And um, we are each a fiber from my point of view. We're each a fiber. And um, when those fibers become yarn or become twine, become fabric, whatever that is, it is a representation for me of who we are. Uh, you know, I just love, you know, the different cultures that we have and the fabrics that we have, they are a representation of us. So, you know, I think of um, the work that I, I did as, a, as, a, as, a, as my hope in what is possible, what is possible for us. Uh, what is possible for us as human beings. There is so much injustice in the world, and I wanted to make a statement about that injustice, but also to say something about uh, the fact that um, we really need each other, and that I cannot be who I ought to be, and you cannot be who you ought to be until we are who we ought to be, until you are who you ought to be, until I am who I ought to be. Um, the, the work that you'll see, that you see in this room here, um, is part of a series called um, uh, Aspirations of the Lost, the Longing, and the Ignored. So I started the work um, as, a, as, a, as a reflection exercise, I was reflecting on people who are who are marginalized. I was really started thinking about some of the guys that I would see on my way to work collecting metal. And I was really just concerned about them and their state in life. Um, and I, I wanted to just to find a way to honor them and to honor their stories. I don't know them personally, but I knew that each person, each of them, just like all of us, was born into this world with significant potential that God breathed life into that person, and the person had came into this world with gifts and abilities. So what happened? So I was curious about that individual. And I was curious uh, about you know, other people like them. In time, um, we began to hear more and more about the situations with the police brutality and the police murders. For me, that was lynching. So the Mike Browns, the Eric Gardners, the Sandra Bland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. From my point of view, that was lynching. And these murders have been going on for some time and they've just elevated and with social media, we know more and more about them. 
These things started long ago. We all know that. Um, so every person, every single individual that was murdered, every single person that sits here in this audience, all of us, we all have, have come into this world with significant gifts and abilities. And those significant gifts, abilities, and interests are things that were planted in us divinely and for a purpose. And so when my life is cut down, when their life is cut down, when any of us are met with injustice or some kind of neglect, we are then crippled. The universe is crippled, as a matter of fact. Our entire community is crippled. So I wanted to say something about that in my vessels. I think my time is probably up. But the vessels represent, um, for me, the stories uh, is a way to honor. It's a way to speak to the importance of community. It's a way to express the life of each individual and to also say something about, as in, in um, what I, uh, Betty mentioned in, my, in, in the introduction, was um, my sense of interconnectedness and interdependence that we have on each other, that we have with each other. Thank you, Linda. And I would like to also add that um, one of the things that really made me fascinated with Linda's work was when I found out that she would make pieces that would be left in a natural surrounding or environment and just left, I guess, until they biodegrade. Uh, and I was wondering uh, if you could briefly just say why that is. So I hung about um, 17 pieces, probably more than that now. Uh, um, I hung about 15 or so in uh, the Fairmount Park area. I did it because, again, it was Mike Brown, Eric Gartner, these things were happening. And I wanted to make a statement about their lives and, again, about their potential. Each of the vessels that were hung in Fairmount Park on Lemon Hill, they're no longer there because um, you know, they are biodegradable. They were organic, they're made of organic materials. Hemp twine is my uh, fiber of choice right now. Um, and so I, I um, hung them to represent each of their lives to make a statement about the lynching, but also to say something about their potential. And so the vessel could become a, a, a nest for a bird or an insect it could, moss could grow in it, and it was a statement about the possibility of that person's life, that the dreams, the story of their life, all the, the, the purpose of their life perhaps could go on in some new way because um, it was planted in the earth, basically. Thank you. I guess we could say that um, those particular works are part of the regeneration of a natural state of being anyway. So um, thank you for that. And I would like at this time um, to go to Charlin. And Charlin did printed textiles. And I'd like you to tell the audience where will visitors find these curtains you've designed and why they're at that location. And what you told me about the inspiration of the symbolism and the colors. Okay. Um, well, the, the textiles are hung in front of the screening room. Uh, when you first enter the, the building off to the right, um, the, the choice to put them there was uh, really about space because of the size that I wanted to um, do the work at, work at um, or the scale I wanted to do the work at. Um, it felt important to print this image in this pattern or in this repetition um, at this scale, uh, which goes back to the, the concept of invisibility. And uh, I usually work with large scale art. I do parade making and uh, found, find and have found that with public art, in doing large scale work, it becomes impossible to ignore the message that's being sent by any group of people when you work at a particular scale. Um, and if you choose to ignore the message, you cannot ignore the work. And so you can't ignore or avoid being impacted by it. 
Um, I think that while the title, Nah, We Made This Place, um, certainly is full of meaning, um, the and it and it's a part of the inspiration of doing doing the pattern. The pattern itself was generated um, through a series of meetings that I did with my communities. Um, uh, we did something called the People's Assembly. We've been experimenting with uh, the tradition of the People's Assembly for going on three years now, and uh, activated a few of them this summer, well, late spring, and with community members, one of the young men that uh, has really, really supported me through uh, activating and holding those spaces was just here. Um, through these assemblies, through these questionings around placemaking and community, we came away from using spoken words and, and that kind of language to using prompts that would encourage us to bring color and shape and pattern and uh, other ways of defining some of the labels and uh, sort of appropriations that have been made to our communities for the sake of development. And even the name um, of the assembly was called Politic Ourselves. We actually have another, um, we have another assembly coming up here later in the month. Um, but Politic Ourselves and using the term creative placemaking and kind of turning it on its on its side or even on its back and saying, how can you make a place that's already here? How dare you, you know, and how dare we allow that? And so as, you know, a group of people that are engaged in these interrogations, it felt really important to bring that language through. And then um, what happened was after that, and for a large part of this process, I actually missed out on being in the original dome because I was in Africa for work for most of the summer. I was in East Africa engaging largely with congas and that kind of making. Um, the musing that happened with community, I ended up taking to um, digital drawing because I didn't have any of my uh, art supplies with me. Well, actually I did, but it was very difficult to be moving around and making. So I did uh, this digital composition and used a symbol that had been coming up throughout the project for me, um, because I also have worked with in um, multiple atmospheres, was the yellow triangle. And then I grabbed colors from the pieces that my community had generated as well, and some of the spheres that are on the piece and concentric circles um, were informed by what they had drawn. And the repetition of the pattern was about them informing that we're seeing patterns here. There's something cyclical going on. So what does it look like for us to repeat the same statement over and over again? Um, and not as if, well, both as if it's historical, but also in the moment. What if we keep repeating our meaning here? We made this place. We made this place. We made this place. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, I'd like to go on to Shari now. And um, Shari had a very special connection with uh, the mass incarceration group, which is another part of Reconstruction's uh, working group. And I was wondering your connection, your special connection to that group, and what um, out of that connection inspired these pillows, and say something about the stitches that you used and the, the shapes, that circular movement, which is something I'm very always attracted to, counterclockwise movement in terms of ritual circles and that kind of thing. And why you prefer hand stitching to machine stitching? Okay, it's all, it's all tied up together, so it's a great question. So, um, the reason I was so involved with AEA wasn't just because of, you know, Denise's uh, availability, but also because of what I talked about, these meetings that always start with a check-in. And, an, oh, alumni ex-offenders is the one, there's two, each panel, each atmosphere had two public sites. 
and they're often understood as community partners. And Reconstruction had a community partner with the Women's Community Revitalization Project, and that was about um, gentrification and displacement. And the other one was, was with Reconstruction Inc. And one of their groups inside of Reconstruction Inc. is Alumni Ex-Offender Association. And it particularly resonated with me um, for two reasons. One is my textile practice is called Home Studio Lab, and it's really about deconstructing white privilege and having those conversations in a very, very safe place with people, which I think is through making textiles together, through sewing, through um, printing, drawing, but all with textiles. Um, so that's one piece of it. And the um, thing about AEA and how they work is it's very, very whole. It's very connected to um, trauma and healing trauma. It's connected to learning, these teach-ins. goes into reconstruction and to the whole history of racism and how it's played out, how it's codified in laws. Um, and it's collectivity and how the group exchanges. And anyone who comes to an AEA meeting, if any one of you came this week, you would have that feeling of community and support and safe safety in that space. So for me, the, um, the uh, healing of trauma uh, has components uh, to it which AEA builds in, but one of the other components is um, that it be rhythmic, repetitious, that it's relational, it's in with a group of people. That's why it's so important to be with a group that sets out this standard. Um, that it's uh, relevant, so it's like appropriate for the people there in their current state. Um, that, let's see, it's a... Uh, rewarding and it's respectful. So for me, stitching and going in the circles is about healing and is a, that has a repetition, it's rhythmic. It, it's for me, it's like the most healing thing I can do is to stitch. And that's probably why I don't like the machine so much because it doesn't have that. So um, my, I, was grateful for all I learned from AEA and Reconstruction Inc. and what it meant I could bring into my practice as a community artist and organizer that's more whole. That's not like just going to a meeting and having a meeting, but it's like, where are we? And how are we here for each other? And let's have this meeting. Thank you, Sherry. And I would also like to say that um, one of the stitches that you use, now I don't know what you call it, but I grew up knowing it as blanket stitch. And it's the one where you have the, the little vertical piece that kind of goes over to another one. And it's a stitch that goes so far back in my childhood that when I saw it, it was just like my mind went right back to there. And I also saw that um, in Diana's work with the uh, attaching of particular shapes and animals. And there's a thread of vocabulary among people who do this kind of work that even if you don't know each other's language, you can show someone by way of your hands and they know what you're talking about. Because I've had that happen when I've worked with Latina groups, um, with various Asian groups. And all I have to do is show them, and they're like, oh, and get right to it. So with that having been said, I would like to go on to Diana. And while she's handling the mic, this is what is going to happen. Around 2.35, instead of a Q&A, these artists are going to go to where their work is located, and you may find them, which is going to force you to see the entire exhibition. And then you can ask them questions or make comments or have some kind of an exchange. And I will say this because I know you've all experienced in Q and A's where there is someone or more than someone that gets up and they want to do a presentation basically of their own. And it is not a question. 
So I thought that I would circumvent all of that by having you have direct interaction with these artists in the area where their work is. Thank you for the hand, because I thought it was a good idea. Uh, Diana, the one thing I do want to say to you is that I have been, not to Argentina, but I have been to Bahia, and you did mention that. So that connection, once you go there, there's something that happens that can't happen anywhere else. And what I wanted to ask you about the quilt that is inside Odunde, um, the influence of your selection of fabrics. Now, you said where they came from, but sometimes the greater challenge is deciding what's going to be chosen and where it's going to go. And if you would tell us um, some of the names of stitches that you used, because I noticed there was a different stitch mm -hmm. to secure the, uh, the animals and other shapes than it was to do the continent and the separations between um, the nations. And the other thing is, if you would say something about the significance of the cowrie shell embellishment as you see it mm -hmm. on your piece. Okay. Um, the selection of the fabrics was based on what was uh, made available to me. Uh, there was uh, the back of a quill, which I was kind of, you know, uh, slapping the hand for showing. It's also the, the large piece with a 50 uh, year celebration of Ghana. And um, the front, we were uh, in my office, I'm a professional, I'm a psychologist in my profession. So we got together in my office and we had this, um, the technique involves a drawing in a piece of paper that has a glue. So you draw the, the, the silhouette of what you want to, um, to, to use, a leaving a margin, and apply to the back of the cloth with the iron. So that transfers the glue from the paper into the cloth. Then you cut following exactly the margin, and you have the, the piece or the different pieces. Um, that then you apply again with the iron to the background. So the selection was made by the participants. I had the bag of cloth there, and I have all these different countries. So they they chose whatever they felt it was appropriate. Um, the silhouette of the countries in the continent is made by a, a chain stitch. So it's a very simple chain stitch. Um, and then the different countries or different pieces need to be secure. It can be secured by machine, by zigzag stitch, or by the different styles of machine stitching. But uh, I realized early on when I was a teenager that I was hyperactive, but not hyperactive in the sense of going and coming and, and moving, but with my hands. Um, I, as, a, as an adolescent, I had uh, an hour bus trip to school back and forth. So I noticed that I was rolling paper. The, the, the tickets that they would give me for the, for the fair, I spent time rolling and rolling. I said, I need to do something more productive in my hands, the roll paper. So since I'm a teenager, I've been sewing, knitting, crocheting, doing lace or folding papers when I sit for long periods of time. And um, when I'm riding in the, in the bus, the subway, the car, or when I'm chit-chatting with friends. So my hands are always busy. Um, the selection of the other pieces, um, there were those two prints from Tanzania, one with the a, with a silhouette of African people that to me represented slavery, and then in a very striking color, animals, uh, in, a, in a very orange striking color. So then I thought, well, I have to put some more animals in this uh, open spaces, so um, uh, I got a children coloring silhouettes and I expanded them and that's how the, 
the giraffes and the and the zebras and all that ended up in the quilt. The, um, at the end, I realized that I had these shells, and I um, I asked my friends what why what the meaning of the shells were for for African people. They explained to me that both shells and salt were used as currency. So I said, well, I have this available. I thought it would be a nice embellishment to put the shells as a, to give some value, some monetary value to, to this uh, in social interaction. And um, why I do quiz, um, I'm a very spiritual person, and um, I believe that... Uh, I'm a very blessed person. God has blessed me with putting people in my life over over the years, very significant, that made changes in my life. I call them my angels. And they opened doors for me. I should be a nice kindergarten teacher in a rural area in Argentina, and I'm here in the United States, fully graduate, PhD, postdoc from Harvard University, working, you know, surviving, working, pay for my education. So I always thank my angels. And as a way of, of, of giving gift to my angels, I've done quilts over the years to give back. Um, three people in my life like cats. So I, I went to every single store in the city and surrounding areas looking for, for a prince with cats. And each one of those three ladies Two of them passed, and now one is 101. Have been uh, had this cat quiz on on their um, on the beds, and at the moment, again another angel came into my life. It's a woman that lost a child uh, to violence, so she is organizing um, the National Homicide Alliance. Um, association or group, and they asked, she asked me and the group of women to help them, to teach them how to make quiz with the clothing left behind by the victim. So that's my next project. And uh, so I, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm pleasing God with the work that I do. Okay, thank you so much, Diana. And I would like to thank all of you for your patience and for coming out today. And I would also like to mention that at three o'clock in the library, um, Denise Valentine will be doing a very special presentation about her installation uh, that deals with enslavement and related issues, and that there are some very interesting documents that you would see. And the library is on the second floor, so you would be, uh, if you're going to that, you would be going to the end of the hallway and upstairs. So I would like at this time to thank the artists for their participation, and I would like to ask you to give them a round of applause. And I would, I would like to give a shout out to family, friends, known and unknown that are here today. Really glad for your presence. And at this time, if the artists will go to their respective Artwork, excuse Betty, me. we want to thank you for organizing this and being such an articulate spokesperson about fibers and textiles. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's a story I could tell, but if you meet me at my quilt, I'll tell you um, about a debate between myself and a fine artist and what they thought about this kind of art form. So to be continued, inside. So thank you very much. <laughs>